down the sharp slopes of the mist hollow, past feral valley creatures ending with a splash, a tedious swim across the cold northerly regions of Anduin the Great River seems to dead end into a marsh dotted with willows, and then plain rock, until we find the way up, hidden in a crevice between sheer walls of stone. It is truly an epic climb up the Kabed Rimdoth. You think you know the Misty Mountains, having been up and down them north and south, east and west at least a dozen times, but the old rock, erected in the long ago of the years of the trees, still keeps her secrets. These peaks were lifted out of the ground by Melkor, Morgoth, the original Big Bad, way back when, as a hindrance to Orome, the Valar who went often abroad on his horse in search of the firstborn. They are shorter now, but still menacing, still sheer and crafty, still a hindrance, especially to us mortals. What could there be on the other side of this foggy and wretched crag? Well, hobbits, of course. It's Lindelby, and you are listening to Beneath Your Feet. The journey upwards begins in the stark wells of Langflood. This is a rocky valley between the misty mountains and the forest of Mirkwood. It's the last stop on our way northwards to Gundabad. Here are the sources of the great river Anduin. Here also are Bjornings and Dwarven Way Stations and the ruins of the Rohirrim from before they even were the Rohirrim. It's an ancient place overflowing with mystery. The never-ending mist doesn't help in that regard. Crossing the river westwards at just the right point brings us travelers to the aforementioned Kabed Rimdoth. The name translates into Abyssal Gulch or something like that. It's a menacing name, and rightly so. This narrow path is more like a ditch set between bouldered crags with bits of grass here and there to remind us that life goes on. Not a pleasant place. And if the landscape and the gloomy music wasn't enough warning, we get an eagle to meet us at every possible turn and tell us to go no further. Death awaits us. No, Mr. Eagle, we are experienced adventurers and shan't be hindered by any fearsome elevation. And yet at this point, one might be tempted to believe they were headed to Mordor rather than up a mountain. The wailing, precipitate waterfalls certainly do not bode well. And then something happens. The stabbing rocks smooth out where once were only shrubs and grasses clinging to crevices in the rock face, now comes a wide meadow. Trees are here, and just on the edge of sight a few houses before which lies a bridge. Well, now we're just curious. Over the bridge and up a far more manageable hill, we find fields, well-tended fields, with stone walls and mills and silos and everything. Beyond that are holes bona fide hobbit holes right here in the middle of nowhere. We find a market, and there's even a real gazebo. We are, of course, immediately transported in mind to the faraway meads and villages of the Shire. Besides shared graphical assets, though these are more gray and mossy, there's a vibe here. Something in the air that smells like bywater or mickle delving, even if all the homes are burrowed and not above ground, but no one is home. Up and up we go, past neatly arrayed lanes leading to circular hobbit doors, till the crown jewel is found, a massive hobbit hole, not unlike Bag End or even the Great Smeals. There we see a face, familiar and yet unfamiliar. Mattelgard Tuka is here to greet us. How came these hobbits to this elevation? We get a bit of information on this very topic in the preface to The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien describes the migration of hobbits westwards from the days of their awakening. The little folk are, essentially, of the same kind as men, and so they awoke at the initial rising of the sun in the first age. Being sensible, they stayed out of the affairs of the broader world and put themselves away in nooks like this one. Though it does not appear to have begun in earnest until the early third age, this migration mirrors that of the elves in some respects. It happened in waves, and the broader people called hobbits are broken down into three groups, Harfoots, Stewars, and Fallowhides, much like the firstborn. We already know the Stewars, the river hobbits. 
we met them back in Enedwaith, in their little town of Mar Tolhau. The houses there are just that, houses. Holes are few and further between, and the stores keep wispy beards, and sometimes wear boots. We were even given a glimpse at what might have been back down south in the Vales of Anduin, as minions of the White Hand are found digging up old and abandoned hobbit holes in their hunt for the ring. There's also plenty of stewerish blood in the mix back in the Shire. Here in the hills and mountains, though, are the Harfoots. These are the original hole dwellers who delved themselves out of the thought of Middle-earth for millennia. It helps that they have eagles on their side, apparently. Who knows how many ages of the world the folk of Lindelby have dug out a living in this cozy and obviously fertile valley. Certainly, they have everything they need. There are good fields for crops, a fishing pond, game coming down off the mountain. There is stone to be found for building and great groupings of happy willow trees. Moreover, there is community. We're introduced to this community one hobbit at a time as well. After our gruff introduction to Grandma Tuka, we are literally sent door to door to introduce ourselves properly and offer aid to the little folk. We catch worms, scare off a wolf, we even entertain the whole town with our stories. As an aside, an abandoned solitary hobbit hole can be found southeastish of town. There's no one outside and no marker, just a curious little hole. It's made known that they call themselves Holbitla, which is great. It sets them securely in their place in history and ties in nicely to the history of Rohan storyline that we get through the Leothrid character. So the folk of Lindelby have been there for a long time. They knew the ancestors of the Rohirrim and took on the name given them in their tongue. Perhaps some of them were even sent south during the last alliance. Perhaps their ancestors were even among that first wave of halflings to move west after their awakening. The unquenchable cheerfulness of that people has apparently not shifted over the millennia. And it's at about just this moment that things become clearer. Hobbits are hobbits, wherever we may find them. Secretive and wary, yes, but trusting when that trust is earned and, above all else, eager in friendship and fun. The entire storyline of Lindelby can be wrapped up in an hour or two of playtime, then we're shipped off back eastwards to the big folk with their big problems. And yet, saying goodbye to our new Hobbit friends is a genuinely moving moment here we get another taste of the plain, simple life of halflings, albeit in a new flavor. We are given a sampling of the simple, pastoral life that so endeared us to the hobbits in the first place. It's the same feeling as that of Bilbo sitting on his lawn, smoking his enormous pipe in the cool air of a shire morning. And not unlike Mr. Baggins, it's interrupted far too soon. Thank you for listening to Beneath Your Feet. For more information on the show, please visit anchor.fm slash L-O-T-R-O-B-Y-F. From there, you can find links to share the show across all platforms. You can message me or send me a voicemail, which might just be included on the show. You can also leave a tip. Any support, a review, a share, a dollar is all very much appreciated. You can also now join me live each month for the Beneath Your Feet research stream on twitch.tv slash Lotro stream. With each stream, we dive deep into a particular region of Lotro, hunt for Easter eggs and details, and talk lore for the upcoming podcast episode. Today's music comes from the Lord of the Rings online soundtrack. This episode was written and read by me. My name is Shoreless, and we'll see you next time when we go Beneath Your Feet.